Hey, what's going on, everyone? Check out what's coming up this week on Legacies. Check this out. That's a, that's a that's a, like a nice little wedding yeah. companion, you know. You keep that <laughs> yeah. in your jacket pocket. What's he got? And, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, what's, he yeah what's he got? Give me the Rolls Royce. I want the Rolls Royce. That's exactly and to me. It sounds like your technologies are the Rolls Royce when it comes to this. I don't know what the future of cannabis is. Besides, like it's really fun to smoke a joint, but I guarantee hemp is going to change the world. It is. It is one of the most powerful industrial plants on planet. Hey, welcome to Legacies, everyone. I'm your host, Tom Ritchie, joined by Wesley Bowles. Wes, how you doing this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Really good. good morning, Vietnam. I mean, that, one's, uh, <laughs> that one's a ways back. Let's remind everyone that Legacies is powered by Breadstack. Retailers, got some news for you. It might be, it's definitely time. Let me tell you this. It's definitely time to upgrade. The reason being... <laughs> I'm just going to go right into it, Wes. So we put out a call last week about one-to-ones, what are your favorite recommendations? And I ended up on a lot of retail sites trying to look through. So I'm using these aggregated um, products and solutions that bring all the product together. They don't have great filtering. I can't find stuff. And I ended up on a lot of sites. And I'm sorry, I know Dutchie has been in the space a long time. I can't handle any of those e-com websites that are powered by Dutchie. I, I just can't do it anymore, especially after being, and this isn't just blowing smoke up Breadstack's ass. I'm telling you, it is a massive difference. Massive difference. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. 100%. You're not along. I'm like, 100%. Yeah, oh yeah. Like it's, yeah, it's I, I can't even believe the stark contrast difference of Breadstack powered e-com sites and Dutchie well, powered. The big, one, the big one for me with that has always been when you have multiple locations, when you have four or five, maybe even 10 locations, right? Dutchie to me, those menus have always been troublesome when I have to, you know, I have to look for one product and multiple stores. I have to, yeah. it's four different pages or five different pages. I have to check each individual. Yeah. Whereas I can sit, like visit a single product listing on a, on a Breadstack site and I could check the, you know what I mean? Like the, It's the, just so the, easy. It's m that much easier to navigate. I honestly yeah. get frustrated. Again, I'm not, I'm not throwing shade at Dutchie. They've, they've been in the space a long time, but um, as we've matured as an industry, as things have taken off, it just do better, um, support your customers. And, and I, I'm not sure if it's because retailers are relying on their foot traffic more, but you know, with the, the moms and the online, uh, illegal sites, you need to compete. There is a massive market opportunity if you just put some time and effort into your site. And I think the frustrating thing for me is some of these smaller indies that do have these multiple locations is just trying to get into my location, into my city. And, it, and I don't know, maybe I'm just complaining, but I, I notice a massive difference. So huge props to Bread, Breadstack. Obviously, you know, they're a show sponsor and we're powered by them, but um, <laughs> we choose very wisely. And I think in this case, um, and I think Ryan's at Bazinga this week. Um, a lot yeah, of people ask him. He just got off a trip, like ride his motorcycle all over the country or some shit like that. Yeah, like, who knows? Doing? The guy's a, the guy's a nice. fucking renegade. He's a renegade. Um, what the fuck is going on with this Hurricane Milton, dude? I know we here we are Man. back to the weather again, but what? I know. You, yeah, we chat about this a lot, and you know me and my conspiracy theories, and I'm like, what the fuck? Like seriously, they just got hit. Now there's another one coming. There was this, you know, documentary or or a what if uh, movie that was put out. I don't know, 2000 nine or 19 or whatever it was, um, with the simulation of what could happen with a category five. And I don't know, you know, thoughts and prayers, obviously to everyone in Florida. I don't know what the fuck is going yeah, on. It's going to be, days. uh, it's going to be a devastating one. I've heard, I've heard numbers now that are apparently it's the biggest, uh, ever recorded in the Northern hemisphere, Northern or Western hemisphere. One yeah, of the two, yeah. sorry, but uh, I, I don't get it. I can't, I, I can't it. believe how quickly. And then it looks like there's one, maybe two more storms on what? the way as well. Na Come Nadine on. is on the way, which I don't know much about, but apparently that's, it's insane, man. It's unbelievable. Well, crazy. and I don't, I don't even know, I don't even know where to go with it. I mean, we've seen the, you know, mother nature taking its toll lately. Um, I think she's upset. <laughs> or, well, <the> yeah, <laughs> well, the other one, the other one is Wyoming. Did you hear about Wyoming? No. That's not, I couldn't find anything on that on the news, but I've seen video clips of it everywhere. 72,000 acres, or sorry, maybe it's 720,000 acres. I'll have to check. Are on fire. 
what? In, in Wyoming right now. Half of Wyoming is burning with, with these fires what in the, the last couple of days. It's fuck? fucking insane. I, yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's unbelievable. Ugh, we need positive thoughts across this entire world, man. Let's, uh, geez. Uh, speaking of positive thoughts, uh, you know, I see a lot of negative comments, whether that's LinkedIn or X, just about the industry. It's just the industry. And then you go to, I mean, we went to CanExec, which was awesome. Thank you, Darwin, for inviting us. We had a, an awesome time. Um, we only managed to get there for one day. We've got so many projects on the go, but it was still incredible. But what I loved was the theme of positivity. It was just everyone you spoke to was upbeat. They, you know, there was a lot of promise still to come. A very, I would say the vast majority of them understood we're at the very beginning and there's a long ways to go yet, especially in this industry as, you know, reform and regulations happen. Um, what was your favorite panel? Did you um, pick one? I enjoyed the the panel with Dr. Uh, oh, I apologize. Dr. Shan. Do, yeah, Dr. Dr. Jackie Shan. Shan. Yeah, Not that Jackie was a really Chan. good panel. Dr. Jackie Shan. Yeah, yeah. Um, Future of medical. Um, I forget the name of the actual panel, but I remember us in the in the middle of it. I'm like, whoa, that's a profound thought that I just had based on what they were conversing about, which is, you know, the need for clinical studies and trials, and obviously it's been very difficult and. You know, Dr. D Jackie Shan is the founder of Cold Effect. So this is not new to her, you know, 20 years in the business of running clinical studies. And she had made a point about collaboration and how the government and the universities and the companies need to come together in order to, one, I think fund, but also um, commit time to these studies. And there's, there's so many things to unfold that we should see if we can get uh, Dr. Shan on at some point in the future. Um, just to discuss this, but you know, what I had said to you was, I'm like, mm, that takes money. <laughs> and you know, when you think about so one, the vast majority of new money that came into the industry, the pump and dumps and, you know, the green rush, that money's gone. Those people are gone, the investors, the VC. But I think I'm looking at it as anyone that were to invest or fund any of these studies now, one, it's very complex, but two is they got to play the long game. Right. Because these studies take, I don't know what Health Canada requires, but they take decades of evidence and research and efficacy to understand. And then you get into, you know, the cannabis plant is very unique uh, in, in such that so many cannabinoids, so many terpenes, so many flavonoids, and those are just the top. Right. And then all the different cultivars that produce all the different. So I think in the, in the, modality of extraction and, and cons consumption that way. So when you're using some sort of extract um, or, you know, ingestible oils, those sort of things, those formulations, yeah, you can study those a lot easier. But if you're looking at the study of flour or pre-roll or just flour pre-roll, the study of flour in general, like how the fuck do you even start with that? Um, and Jay, Jay Schwartz brought that up, I think on his panel, there was something about, because they were talking the future of medical, um, you know, and obviously representation from various medical platforms were, were discussing that, but yeah, I don't know where the fuck you go with that, man. Like it, it, it just seems like a <laughs> massive amount of work. If she's leading or willing to lead it, have confidence that it'll happen. Holy yeah, smoke, she's smart. A hundred percent. Crazy smart. Anyways. Um, Overall though, really, really good day. Really, really good. Oh, I know it was so good. for a couple of days. We only went for the one day, but, um, yeah, great event, uh, and I think the the networking function of it all, just just speaking oh, yeah. to people, was was you know as good as the panels were. The networking, I think, is where a lot of the really deep conversation happens. Yeah. So um, so yeah, many so many individuals coming up and you know welcoming us and and saying hi. Just wanted to say hi, and you feel bad because you know the individuals, but you haven't connected with them personally. So you're trying to put a face to the name, and you're scanning your LinkedIn, uh, but the you know the picture tiles are like this big and you, know, you look nothing like your picture that being yeah, yeah. oh actually no i updated my linkedin profile you updated picture. yours yeah, 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 yeah mine was uh quite old <laughs> i think a lot of people just keep their old photos yeah older. you're not high and tight anymore that's why yeah. i and tight i thought about it the other day maybe getting rid of it and then i thought oh winter is coming yeah winter, I've, got, summer. I, I've been looking i i bought one last year i i do not like the cold i'm not going to take this negative approach to i hate the cold i hate winter i love winter i love the opportunities there but i need to stay warm these old bones need to stay warm. So last year, my son thought this was the funniest thing. I was on the on the the hunt for a pimp jacket, like one that went to my ankles, full down. He's like, "You're gonna look crazy," and I'm like, "I don't care, I don't care." 
This kid had me in hockey arenas for 12 years, three times a week. Like that, that cold mm. gets into your bone and it doesn't leave for mm -hmm. sometimes hours and hours. Anyways, uh, I'm going to keep my eye open. I did find one. I did find one. It's not quite as long. I think it only goes to about my knees, but. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a peacoat guy myself. I'm a peacoat guy myself. Those yeah. are, that's where I'm at. My buddy yeah. Jerry goes out in a sweater all the time and he's, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, hey, listen, he's first responder. So, you know, I'm like, you got a coat in your car at least? Like a jacket in your car? Nah. I'm like. You tell us to prepare for everything, and yet you just run around in a t-shirt and a sweater outside in the middle of a yeah. fucking blizzard. But anyways, um, so a couple things that I think we should discuss. One is, I don't know which direction. Should we talk about, we got a care package this week. I don't know if we should, let's go care package and then we'll do OCS campaign. Let's go care Because I really want to highlight the OCS campaign. But first of all, yeah. um, so we met with Aspire. We were already familiar with them and you were huge advocate of their moon rocks way back, if you recall. And, um, we were working towards getting Cy on and if not Cy, then maybe Michael, um, I can tell you one thing, listen, friends, this is how you do a care package. I, I love all the care packages we get, but it, these are the types of packages I think they send out to retailers when they request samples. And let me, I'm going to try and do this justice. Okay. Because I was blown away. Um, just yeah, this is, this is a, a crazy Did you pack. keep yours together? Oh, oh yours is all open. So let me show people what to expect when they do so, okay? So this is, I'm going to hopefully not drop anything. So this is the way it's presented inside lid. Like, I mean, the, you know, you, these are extra details. They may seem very minor, but to me, I'm an Apple guy. So when I unlock or unwrap an Apple, so you've got some nice product cards on the front. You've got, you know, another thank you card. And then well presented inside, you get this beautiful bag with product. And I'll get to that in one second because there's some pretty cool stuff that's in here um, and not stuff that I won't use. Okay. So I know I'm all over the place here. So this is awesome metal coaster. That is going to come in handy. I'm but, using that right now. Are you? Yep. So this keychain. Now, if you're not familiar with Aspire, they have these orbs and, and uh, the moon rocks. And this will hold, I haven't tested how many it'll hold. I think it'll hold five. So you've got this on your keychain, you know. Stress getting you to the day or getting you for the day. You just pop one of those in there. But what I loved is this, this, uh, so they've got their, their shots, right? And this is this awesome little shot glass. These small touches, man. They mean a lot. I'll tell you one thing. Yeah. I that's will for the never, mood shot, right? Yeah. I'll never forget yeah. the brand based on this, right? Um, no. Have you Absolutely had the moon shots before? So one of the things that I had mentioned to Cy and, and Michael when we were on the call with them, I said, I don't really drink anymore. So when we go out, you know, I'll get a, a cranberry soda, right? With a lime. I said, but we're still in this weird industry where you're not allowed to order anything like that. And they've got, you know, the spark moonshot, um, which is awesome. It's dosed. I think you get, uh, what is it? 10 activations out of this. So you could use your little shot glass, but being able to carry something with you. I mean, it reminds me of an old whiskey flask you can keep on the inside, right? Just keep it in your blazer pocket if you're out. Um, yeah. but now you can infuse on the go, right? So I don't have to worry about whether or not we're going to put that, I'm going to put that there for right now. Um, check this out. That's a, that's a, that's like a nice little wedding companion. You know, you keep that in your, in your <laughs> yeah. jacket pocket what's at a wedding. He got? And, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, what's he doing? Yeah. There? What's he got? <laughs> um, but check these out, all these different, you know, the spark moon rocks, right? I I'm in love with, I haven't got to these ones yet. Um, but various spark moon rocks, these halos. So the halo is the other side of their brand. Um, and I am like going crazy over these CBD sour cherries. Um, they're awesome. So these tiny little orbs, right? Halo orbs, um, 25 of them in a, in a container, but I just, I love when things are done right. You know, I'm a marketing guy and, um, and if you want to have a lasting impression with your audience, customer, you know, speaking customers at this time, those are typically retail bud tenders, right? That's where a lot of these are going. And they did it right. Did it right. Yes. So many brands um, could take notice of this and how they do it. And then you've got all your, you know, they've got a technology called Rapid Sense, right? And I want to make sure that, um, so it's, it's the way your body is absorbing it. I'm not going to do it justice, but definitely check out Aspire. You need to check out Aspire Infusions. Um, they're not paying us for this. This is just beautiful care pack. And I was blown away. I think instantly I opened it 
asked if you had gotten yours and sent an email back and said, kudos, do not ever lose your marketing team. Um, but beautiful, you know, cards with, you know, if I'm a retailer, wholesale unit, the cases, OCA, uh, OCS pricing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even to go as far as to break it down by uh, cost by milligram. That's, hu- that's huge. Amazing. I do I'm this gonna, myself, um, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, look, oh, okay, how much am I getting? No, nah, that's not worth it, right? Um, yeah. Very cool. I'll, uh, what I'll do is I, t- I took some nice photos yesterday of everything that was oh, yeah. included in there. So I'll, I'll post those. Uh, probably won't post them on Instagram. There's a lot of THC uh, logos on there, <laughs> but I'll definitely post them on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and they'll be on the website as well on, on uh, legaciespodcast.ca. Yeah. You can find Can't wait to get, the uh, get Cy and, and Michael and I don't know who else will have joined. I just need, we need to get someone to talk about, I just love their expansion, their methodology, um, you know, understanding the consumer, what's working, what's not working. Um, you need capital for that, right? You do, you need a proper business mind to go, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to launch into X markets. Um, how are we going to do it? How are we going to get feedback about the products that we're putting in the market? How do we continue to innovate? Um, but they are an, an innovative company for sure. Uh, and I love seeing that in the space. Oh, great. Yeah. And, and like you said, just reiterating the point of, cause we still probably don't see a ton of it right now with a lot of brands, but they, from the marketing aspect, they, they 100% get it. 100%. Oh yeah. Get it. Oh, yeah. And, and that's exciting to see. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Um, anyways, so <laughs> I don't know where to start unpacking this whole OCS campaign. Um, so for our audience, the OCS is launching a campaign. It's an awareness campaign mainly um, to help understand the differences between legal and illicit product. And, you know, at first, I think when notice went out to retailers, there was kind of a split opinion on you know, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Um, personally, I applaud the OCS. So what they're doing is launching this, the, it's called the buzzkill campaign. And I'll speak to, you know, some of the issues why I could see it, but anyway, so they're launching this, um, buzzkill campaign. They, I think they're doing a Reddit takeover today. Um, and starting Correct. with that, they have a, a pop-up store. This is really cool. So the OCS has have a pop-up store on queen street. It's a fake store, completely fictitious with all the product in it to uh, resemble illicit you know, product. Um, how much foot traffic will they get in? I don't know. That doesn't matter um, to me anyways. At the end of the day, I think there's going to be a ton of media exposure and it's going to help at least plant a seed in consumers that are not. You now, we're talking to consumers that are not following all the brands. They're not you know, the ones that are all over Instagram, on X, in Reddit. We're talking about the general public that are kind of curious, right? And these individuals, sometimes they're confused. It's not even they're confused. They don't even know they're confused. They just yeah, see, they, know. they see, hey, a legal, they see a store and they think, oh, it must be, yeah. it must be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what are they, what are they going to, it's operating. So either, you know, they don't realize that the illicit operators, they have, you know, huge balls. They don't care. Right. In some cases they're indigenous and there's, you know, we're going to get Rob Lorian to talk about that, but they're they're at least doing something. And now one of the things that I had said to you, I said, well, Wes, like what onus does the OCS even have? They have no obligation to do this. And I get it. Yes, they make money. And I get why retailers could potentially be upset about this, which is, you know, what marketing company did they use? You know, this is probably a three, $500,000 campaign, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they're only doing a pop-up, but they're not only doing a pop-up. The OCS, they're in incredible to deal with. I mean, their, their comms team, we reach out typically yep. we've got a response within no time. And in this case, we wanted to understand the intricacies of this campaign. And from, I don't know how much of the audience knows this. I spent almost a decade in advertising and marketing, working at an ad agency, built a media company in that space. I'm very familiar with marketing campaigns, the development, the creative, everything that goes into it. I can say that the vast majority of this campaign regardless of the cost, regardless of it's, you know, one of Doug Ford's buddies at a marketing agency, getting the budget and getting this work, that doesn't matter. Um, at the end of the day, they're looking for media exposure or at least the ability to communicate to those can of curious. And I think this is a good way of doing it. Uh, some areas, you know, Reddit, I think Reddit, the vast majority of individuals are, unless OCS just wants to get in everyone's face and piss off the black market, I don't know which can of curious individuals are in Reddit checking out, um, you know, what's going on, but Hey, 
I keep coming back to there is zero obligation from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, from the OCS to do this. Now, this is their their, yeah, their campaign. Yeah, does not include that, correct. Yeah, it doesn't include yeah. this. But, the, you know, obviously they make money. They're distributors. They also have their online sales, which they do well. Um, but at least they're doing something, right? At, at least they're doing something. They're trying to do something. This is their fourth campaign. Is that right? Fourth campaign uh, or sixth campaign? Ooh, fourth or, like fourth sixth. or sixth campaign they've I run. I have the email here. It's, um, it's one of those. Yeah. yeah. And, and prior um, to Legacies, I'm not overly familiar with the campaigns they previously ran. Um, but you know, this under buzzkill, illicit cannabis is a buzzkill. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to read some details off, uh, yeah. from their response when, when we reached out to the OCS for comment on the campaign. So, uh, in regards to the buzzkill campaign, this campaign launches in two parts, a digital public education campaign, which runs, uh, on various age gated platforms from October 7th to November 30th. Uh, and will uh, again, will run in early 2025. Um, the buzzkill, uh, highlights that. Sorry, uh, the campaign highlights the buzz kills that come with the legal cannabis uh, and promotes the cannabis retail seal uh, as the best way for consumers to know they're shopping safely. Uh, and then finally, to amplify this message, on October 17th, we'll be opening a buzz kill, a four day pop up activation designed to resemble an illegal dispensary. When visitors enter the store, they'll be subtle, they'll see subtle hints that this is not an AGCO authorized cannabis retailer, um, you know, no cannabis retail seal. And uh, products with harmful contaminants and other issues, such as toxic levels of other authorized pesticides, et cetera, uh, will also be listed. So that's a little bit, little bit of detail on uh, on that campaign that I'll be running. I think it's cool. Um, I do, I do understand the the certain retailers and retail operators that could be upset about this. I mean, I, I get it. Um, but again, let's come back to the OCS has no obligation to do this, but they are, um, and they are spending some of that money. Listen, if the OCS doesn't spend their air quote profits. That goes to the finance minister people, okay? They, they get enough fucking tax money, right? The, the minister of finance is doing fine in Ontario. Um, but anyways, I think it's good. We'll, we'll, we'll show up, right? Yeah, we'll the other there. thing with this too is like, I could see it as well where, you know, retailers might be upset that the OCS didn't ask for feedback on this beforehand uh, to roll this campaign out. But I'll remind everyone too that, and the OCS mentioned this too, is that the OCS you know, they, they don't go into this stuff blindly. They do their research when they're looking into this stuff. Is it always perfect? Maybe not, but they also do their quarterly surveys with retailers about campaigns and things that they've run um, in the past. So make sure, you know, they will ask for feedback on this on their next quarterly survey. Uh, so make sure you fill that stuff out as well. But again, for anyone thinking that, oh, it's a single pop-up is not going to do much for, uh, you're not going to reach that many people with foot traffic on, on making them aware of illicit stores. Again, I don't think the foot traffic is necessarily the point, as you mentioned. The hope is that there's going to be this some is, media crap yeah, here. This is a guerrilla campaign in a way. There could be a, yeah. there could be a news van there. Who knows? And all of a sudden, that's on the well, on the on the hot seat, right? I, and, I put and, it in front of Nick Dixon at CP24 um, and said, "Hey, you know, we're we're in contact with the OCS. We can share more details. We'll let you understand." So, I would suspect even even if no mainstream media were to pick this up, which I guarantee they will, um, there'd be a ton that do follow the OCS on Reddit, on Instagram, et cetera, that are showing up. They're going to take additional video and photos. They're going to, it's, I don't know. And October 17th, obviously, you know, legalization day. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, yeah. The final thing I'll, I'll note on this as well is uh, we did provide some of our own feedback to the OCS based on what we saw on some of their landing pages and things related to this campaign. And we gave them some feedback and they were very open to that feedback. A couple of things are also going to be amended um, based on our, our, our feedback that we sent over. Um, the one thing I will point out is the the OCS has a store locator on there, all right? yeah. an authorized store locator on there, and it is an opt-in service. So make sure if you're a retailer yes. and you're not listed on there to make sure you you get yourself listed. Check your box, get yourself listed on that uh, as an authorized store because if I check Google Maps for dispensaries around me and then I compare that to the map that's on the OCS, your store may not be listed there mm -hmm. if you're not opt into that. So you want to make sure, especially with this campaign running, that people aren't looking at that going, oh, I see this on Google Maps. It's not there. It's a good point. I'm not going to go to that store. So make sure you, you, you know, you connect with, I don't know how that works. If you just log in and check I'm your sure box they or know, you have to reach uh, out to your account manager, but yeah. make sure you, you can opt in on it. There. And, and that's yeah. where I was confused at first. I'm like, wait, some of the retailers, even in my neighborhood aren't on here. And then you yep. asked OCS and they said, that's an opt in. So opt in, <laughs> you need to opt in, um, at least for this. I mean, it's just more exposure. It only does more for you. Remember there are individuals that shop or at least visit the OCS. I don't know what their site traffic is. I'm sure it's, it's probably good. 
Um, but if they click that, find a store, you, can, you need to opt in. It's the only way you're going to yep. get there. Yep. Um, we got a pack show again. We're, we're double stacking guests a, a lot lately. Um, I do apologize, but that's the only way that we're going to get people in, in a timely fashion. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we so many people to talk to. I feel like at some point in the future, we're going to be doing two episodes a week. I, I have just a feel list like that's the of, way we're going. oh my God, I owe these people responses with when we can get them in. Um, we're trying, we're trying our best. Um, but today is interesting. So widgets, widgets, um, We've got Michael is, joining us as the founder. Yeah. That is a cool device. It, the, all of them are, but I mean, what I'm really excited about is the American Medical Association. From what I understand, we'll get Michael to, uh, to clarify for us. I think they're the only company that they endorse and recommend in medical use situations for cannabis. How the fuck do you get that? That's crazy. Um, one, yeah. I think it was the, you know, the initial technology behind their pipe with the maze. We'll, we'll see if we can show photos of it while Michael talk about that as well, but, um, wild. Uh, and then we've got, uh, Eugenio Garcia from Cannabis Now, a very, very prominent cannabis media company and publication in the U S. Uh, we're going to learn some lessons and see what's going on in the U S versus what can we do in Canada? Obviously marketing restrictions, there's, you know, I think brands struggle as well. I, they may not have the capital to promote and advertise, but, um, but what they do well, at least at cannabis now is keep their finger on the pulse of the industry. And, and that's pretty fucking cool. It takes a yeah, lot I, of work. I think today's episode is going to be great for Canadian, you know, businesses as well, because yeah. I go back to what Michael Elkin yes. and the Canada Broker said in an episode way back, right? It, this is your opportunity for when we give you content like this, if you can't make it down to U.S. trade shows to do that market research of what's happening in the States and could be happening here, we're kind of planning to, to, to bring a little bit of that to you in this format so that you don't have to travel down there and do yeah, that yeah. research. We can bring a little bit of it to you. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be really valuable for, for uh, our Canadian audience especially. Yeah. And just interesting. This is, I always go back to this. I just I am a curious person and these are curious products and companies and I just want to be able to chat with them and understand one, how do they get there? Uh, two, what are their struggles or what are their successes? And, you know, maybe we can glean from that in this industry, right? Um, I realize, you know, not federally regulated, but they still have way more opportunity for some reason. Um, well, I do know the reason. I know the reason. Health Canada. Well, 10x the population helps as well. Well, but, you that, know. that certainly fucking helps. <laughs> that certainly helps. Um, Anyways, we'll, uh, we'll have them on when we return right after this break. Breadstack e-commerce. It might be time to upgrade. All right. Welcome back, everyone. We're joined by Michael Barenboim, founder of Widgets. Michael, thanks for joining Legacies, man. Thank you for having me, guys. I'm glad to be here. Listen, I was a little concerned because I know your company is based out of Florida, and we were actually talking about this in our pre-segment with the hurricane coming I can just imagine what you're going through, but you still took the time to join us. That's awesome. I always have time for you guys. Uh, it's, uh, it's This is what I do. I'm not worried about the hurricane. Uh, and when it comes, we'll deal with this. Well, you're a crafty inventor. Something tells me you've got something going on outside to uh, divert maybe the storm of some sort. But um, I, oh, I do want to... It's, it's already been patented. It's been a... <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, and we will get there, but I think, uh, what, 100, 100 patents at least... Yes, I think it's a little over. I stopped counting, uh, but this is what I do. I, uh, I'm a professional inventor simply because I got lucky to get into a medical device engineering field uh, in the 90s, right after school. Uh, and I stick to this and I loved it. And uh, because of that, I've, I've, I've spent my entire career in developing medical devices, life-saving technologies. And that's, uh, that is my uh, basis for developing, continuously developing new products to help people. Yeah. Well, I, when we were first introduced to uh, Widgets and your products, I was like, wow, like some, some of the technologies in this, like it's just crazy. And the dupe tube, especially, I sent that to one of our other partners yesterday. I'm like, check this out as we were doing the pre-show. And, but I, I want to talk about, obviously, your devices, but let's first understand, like, how did you approach the industry? You're talking about in medical, medical side and life-saving devices. What made you decide, you know what, I'm going to move into the cannabis industry and start inventing for this space. 
Yeah, you, you are correct. I, again, spent my entire life developing medical devices, but along the way, I also helped to develop some other products in different fields, uh, like some sporting products, uh, some toys. Uh, my kids were actually in a big commercial on the mainstream TV uh, for some of the products that I've developed. Like, uh, I don't want to mention them here, but uh, we've done, I've done quite a few things. And uh, coming to uh, a cannabis industry, I'm actually a smoker myself, and uh, I smoke every day. Maybe that's why I'm able to come up with, with uh, <laughs> so some, many some creative the visions, yeah. uh, technologies, <laughs> and ideas uh, because of that. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it was quite simple. I'm a smoker, and unfortunately, my kids started smoking early in school. Uh, and instead of prohibiting them from smoking, I did the next best thing. I developed uh, safer devices for them uh, to smoke uh, because I know prohibition doesn't work. So for me, for, uh, prohibiting them from smoking would never work. So I uh, started thinking, what can I do to help them and to help my friends to smoke safer, cleaner, smoother? Uh, because this industry has quite a few issues with some of the devices that people release. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of things that we can do to help people to smoke a lot safer. Yeah, I love that story. That's awesome. Um, you pointed something out is you almost have to go with it. I understand, you know, my kids coming of age and I'm like, you know, I had the talk early on, obviously with them. I've been in the cannabis space for quite some time. And I think my talk originally was, listen, if you need any information, you come to me and then we'll go from there. Right. Um, but what was the, like, so that epiphany moment and the design what was the first design was it the the maze pipe no actually it was a very simple uh adapter for joints pre-rolls because when every time when we smoke a joint or when we smoke a pipe or one heater was my, uh, one of my favorites every time when we smoke this toxic resin gets on your tongue i think the the the, the problem is so big that people nickname those things that uh, some of them they call them scooby snacks it's like that. So this was the first task that I wanted to attack for me and my friends, because every time when you get a last hit, especially with a pipe, you're always looking for that cherry uh, and you're thinking, is it going to fly and burn my throat? And if it does, yeah. you know, what happens the next for a week, yeah. you can't smoke because your throat hurts, you burn your tonsils uh, uh, <clears throat> and you have this itching sensation on your uh, um, in your throat because you want to uh, get rid of this um, sensation. But actually, resin covers your tonsils, and that's what creates the sensation of <clears throat> you always want to do this. And uh, uh, that was my first product, uh, and uh, we started selling them uh, on Amazon, on Etsy, uh, and all of a sudden we started this as a joke. Um, because uh, a lot of uh, my friends loved it. Uh, I loved it, but I never thought it would go anywhere. So we just started selling it. And all of a sudden, uh, everybody is loving them. My friends, people started buying them. And uh, I think we've sold uh, close to half a million uh, wow. of those units on Amazon alone in the past few years before we finally got kicked out from Amazon for selling, uh, uh, as they call drug paraphernalia. But... Uh, uh, we uh, we sold them as a cigarette holder, so people knew people knew right away what they do, and because of the reviews, people had just um, <laughs> thought that they were amazing, and uh, some called it as a uh, next the best thing for uh, you know after the sliced bread. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there we we had a lot of uh, funny uh, notes and reviews for this. So that's how we started with a small adapter, and then I decided not to stop because cannabis. Uh, uh, device field is segmented to multiple markets. Uh, one of them is a pipe market, one of them is a one heater market, bong market, and et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, vaporizers and, and the list goes on. So I think what uh, I started doing is, is I started developing devices for each of those segments, just wanted to do it better. And the priority for better uh, is safer. This is what I've done all my life, developing medical devices. And I think it's important for me as a developer to continue doing what I'm doing because the uh, compensation and money is great, but the reward from uh, hearing how much we help people and how much better their lives becoming. And in this particular case, uh, people are leaving reviews that uh, they will never go back uh, smoking without filtration or smoking without cooling. So this gives me a, a complete satisfaction 
uh, on for for what we are doing. So it's, it's it's a great reward for me besides the money. You know, you're talking safer, but how do you get because your products? I don't know if all the products are going to let you correct me on this, but you have endorsement from the medical, the American medical side of things, right? I'm not sure the exact um, company or, or what it's called, but in that vein. How do you do such a thing? Because I'm thinking in Canada, there's just no way. I mean, we've got obviously so there's some prominent manufacturers and they they focus on vape and that sort of thing. But how do you get that? Because reviews are one thing, but when you get that endorsement, that's huge. You, you are absolutely correct. This endorsement opened up so many doors for us, and it was not very easy to achieve because any medical association in the United States you you go to, they will never look into combustionable. Uh, combustion devices where, uh, you know, they may approve some uh, um, uh, vaporizers, they may approve something else, but when it comes to combustion devices, they will stay away because it doesn't correlate to their medical profession. But in this particular case, the it's a big uh, cannabis nurse association in the United States. It's a big organization. It's a group of nurses, thousands and thousands of people who are trying to help people to smoke correctly for different uh uh, medical conditions. Uh, and when I first reached out to them and the answer was exactly the same, they said, well, listen, we don't want to touch any combustion uh, devices because that goes um, you know, against our policies that we are not going to advocate for smoking devices. But everybody knows that uh, actually smoking uh, combustionable devices and inhaling smoke gives you the fastest onset for any medical condition. Because no matter I have a lot of vaporizers, and, and as many of them I, as I smoke, I, I smoke them for a little bit, and then I put them in the drawer, simply because they don't give me enough uh, strength, they don't give me enough uh, THC, or not fast enough for me to work. So I always put them, and, and this happens to a lot of people. I do the same. I do the yeah. same thing. Yeah. So every time I come back to smoking uh, joints, to smoking one heaters, to smoking pipes, uh, because I love the taste of uh, cannabinoids, I love the taste of terpenes, and uh, smoking um, combustion uh, devices like pipes gives you the best uh, experience. And that's why they, they try to stay away. And, and then I, I finally convinced the president of this association, I said, just try it. I mean, just try it, because it's like drinking dirty water, and then all of a sudden I uh, introduce you to filtration. That's exactly what we're doing here. People are still going to smoke, no matter what. They're going to smoke, continue smoking joints, pre-rolls, blunts. Uh, but what can we do to help them to smoke safer? And that's the obvious answer is introduce them uh, the filtration. And as you introduce the filtration, the temperature of the smoke also goes down because those are two things. And I think temperature of the smoke plays a much bigger role. So when we shipped them the, 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 the products, the, it, it actually took them four months to investigate. But when they did, they called me screaming, saying, how did you do this? Because the experience that they had, first of all, it's much cleaner smoke. You, you don't get anything on your tongue. Uh, no more Scooby snacks because the filters and the screens, they block everything. And uh, while they're doing that, they also lower the temperature. Because if you compare the temperature smoke, you know the temperature when we light up the pipe is about 1,400 uh, degrees Fahrenheit at the bowl. That's when it's burning. So when we inhale the smoke with the regular pipes or short pipes or long pipes, it's about 250 degrees, 300 degrees. That's the reason why people cough. It's because the heat uh, uh, goes into your uh, pathways and uh, your lungs and your pathways don't like this, so they try to contract. And that's why people cough. That's the reason why people cough. It's the same as you go to a, um, a hot sauna or haman. Uh, people who are not used to it, they start coughing right away. It's because of the heat. Michael, you just tipped the sacred cow. <laughs> Do you realize you did that? So, because you go back to the old days of, you don't cough, you don't get off. And, you know, oh, this must be really potent because I'm coughing like crazy. Well, Which is not believe, true. It's believe it or not, teenagers uh, still think that. And, and <laughs> people who are young, they still think that because they think it's fun. But the older we become, the more mature and smarter and wiser we become, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And every time, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself a question. What's more important to you, uh, more important than anything else in the world? And the answer is always the same. It's your own health. What can you do with a bad health? So every time when people think about spending a dollar uh, here and there, the number one priority for me 
and for people I, I um, work with is how do we make it safer? How do we make it more pleasant? So whatever we did with this device is not only made it safer, which is one thing, but also made it a lot smoother. So people don't have to cough uh, their lungs out. Uh, you still can cough because it depends on many variations. How sure, you sure. take it. Some people like to take big rips, which is absolutely necessary. Some people prefer to keep the smoke in their lungs for as long as they possibly can without realizing that it doesn't do anything except hurting their lungs. Uh, THC absorbs immediately. So all you have to do is you inhale and then you exhale immediately and you're going to get exactly the same result. So people, I think, need to have an education. And I think Widgets is not only uh, a device company, but we try to make sure that every time when we do something, we also try to help people to educate them how to smoke correctly because there are different techniques uh, of uh, people inhaling smoke. People do big rips, people do short puffs, people uh, exhale a little bit of cloud of smoke and then inhale it back. So all those things are very important to understand. And fortunately, a majority of our customers are uh, older people, people who understand the importance of uh, safer inhalations. And uh, that's why we are so successful, uh, is because it's a measurable result. You know, sometimes you have a gimmicky product and people uh, actually try it and uh, we don't feel the difference. Right, but in right. this particular case, it's, it's vice versa. From the first heat, People start swearing, and we have a lot of videos during the shows when we give it to people and they try it, and they swear in disbelief. They said they've never thought that it would be possible to inhale it, and it feels like you're inhaling air, because if you smoke it correctly, it feels you, I think you've tried it with the Duke tube and, uh, and other products. So that's how uh, uh, we got the approval for uh, endorsement uh, for all of our products, and especially Maze X pipe, because Maze X pipe, filters the smoke in three different places and you can add the fourth level of filtration by by using our charcoal filters together with this wow so so that was uh, let, let me just correct that because i think when you said it the nurses you, you so that would be the acna correct yes, is that the ACNA. yeah right right um yeah i got to get my head wrapped around some of these acronyms sometimes there's so many um one of the things so on that point about you know the individual so there's a couple things that i want to touch on so one is i find it at least for kind of curious, and especially the ind individuals in my demographic getting a little bit older, they, you know, there's a joint circle or something going around and they see someone just coughing their lungs out. That's a turn off to some, right? They're going to like, well, I'm not going to enjoy that. I don't want to. But I want to double down on your point about the videos because we did obviously a lot of run up research. I love the amount of educational content that you put out for your products. And that's something that I think is lacking in this space, right? So there's, there's a myriad of products that are available across this industry, be that Canada, US, Australia, it doesn't matter. Um, but what they lack in a lot of cases is the education. And we have to be careful in Canada, especially education, because you, know, you can't promote and that's just an inducement. So, But I love that you have so much content where it was how you use the product and the benefits and the safe modality of that product. Yes, I think, I think it's very important because, uh, you know, we all uh, adjust our lifestyles when we learn something. And, and I think it's, it's, uh, we're going to make this um, an important feature for all our products and for our company and for our brand is to tell people how they can do things better. And that's, then it's up to people to decide whether they want to do it or not. For some people, they still think, well, uh, I want to take a big rip no matter what. Okay, so you can do that, but you can also put a seat belt and, and continue driving uh, 300 miles an hour or 200 miles an hour right into the wall. It's not going to help you. It's only going to help people who want to be helped, who want to smoke safer, who want to smoke smoother. And when you do, uh, it gives you such an amazing reward because what happens in a week after you smoke with our filters or with our devices, all of a sudden your throat doesn't hurt anymore. Your lungs are not hurt as much anymore because you reduce all those harm, harmful elements drastically. We all know that smoking is still bad. We all know that. But uh, what we found is that we found we can do a lot of things to make it safer. And uh, uh, it, it's very interesting that we are a small, young company, but we are the first device company to get an official endorsement from a medical association in the United States. And it's not a small association. It's a really 
big group of uh, medical professionals. Uh, and uh, we are very proud of that. That's a uh, massive achievement. You should, yes, be, you should and, be proud of that. Yeah, and we're very, very happy with that. And we're very happy that we're able to help people. So that's where we are with that uh, endorsement. And we're going to continue working with this group. We're going to participate in their uh, classes where they teach people. Uh, we have a lot of uh, customers who have asthma, people who have COPD uh, and emphysema. And, you know, at that point, you would think that uh, they would not want to, to smoke anymore. But people still do. And uh, every time when we get an email saying, oh, my God, I have asthma and your devices help me so much because I can take a small puff and still get medicated, uh, but with much less harm and a lot smoother. So that's very important. This is, for us. This is a really good point. I think Wes has a question too, but let me get this out before I forget it. Um, so in, in Canada, you know, we have medical recommendations, right? And in, in order to get a air quote prescription, it's a recommendation. And I still remember all these conversations that uh, individuals would have with the doctor in order to get these medical recommendations for medical cannabis. And none of them, they, they would always say, we don't recommend smoking. And the, again, coming back to this, it's, that's the rapid onset. That is the quickest way to achieve your, you, you, the effects of your medicine. Um, so I, I find it strange that Canada won't take this approach necessarily. Maybe there's organizations that can endorse, um, but at least look at it this way. In the back of their minds, these doctors are going, this guy's going to, he's going to go smoke a joint. Like just, that's what they're going to do. They're going to rip a bong. They're going to smoke a joint. Um, so it's, it's nice to see that, you know, an individual like yourself and a company is bringing this to the forefront saying, we get, you're still going to do it. You're not going to stop it. And you made a great analogy is, you know, driving 300 miles an hour without a seatbelt. Well, let's at least figure out some happy medium, right? And if you can do it safer, buckle the seatbelt up. Um, anyways, Wes, did you have a, a question that you wanted to ask? Michael? Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to, you know, uh, you've got, you obviously got great products that are, that are, that are helping people every single day that the medical aspect of it is, is truly inspiring. And but on top of that, the devices are are beautiful as well. Like they're they're very discreetly designed. They've come in some great colors. I, I kind of wanted to know where you pull your design language from. Did you, did, was there inspiration you took, uh, you know, externally for applying to these products? Because they're very unique, very beautiful. Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Wes. Um, you know, my uh, you know maybe this is a good time uh, you know to talk a little bit about my education. So I have a. Uh, two master's degree in mechanical engineering, one from university uh, in Moscow and one from uh, uh, Northeastern University uh, in Boston. But I'm also uh, an industrial designer myself, and and I have a group of industrial designers who work with us. Uh, so uh, it's always a collaborative effort. Uh, you know, we come up with ideas, we design it, and we're, we operate like a normal uh, design company. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and every time when we release something, we see how the market reacts, what people like, what colors people like, uh, and the aspect in industrial design is not about how the product looks, but also how the product functions, how convenient it is. And, and every time when we design products, unfortunately in this industry, what people are trying to do, they're trying to introduce different artistic designs and glass and, and other devices, what we focus on is we focus on solving problems. Like for instance, um, the next problem we're going to solve is one heater. We're going to revolutionize one heater market uh, because we're about to release one heater that's going to change it all. Uh, and I will just, uh, I'm, it's, it's being patented right now, but uh, uh, what I can tell you um, uh, is it's going to be the first one heater that's going to be smell crew because that's a problem for people. Every time when you have uh, a dugout and one heater and you close this little lid, it smells. It still smells. Stinks. It's not a complete, yeah. Right. It stinks, especially when you smoke and you put it back inside. So that's one problem we're going to solve. Second issue, I know you're not going to believe me this, but from the time you load one heater and from the time you clean it, you do not ever have to touch flour with your fingers. Ever. Uh, and I know it sounds strange, but that's exactly <laughs> how it's going to be. You can load wow. this by holding your uh, 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 one heater, and you can uh, prepare your dugout uh, on a go with five different cartridges. What? Uh, you preload at home, and while you are out, uh, there's another problem with one heaters, is every time when you try to pass it to your friend, you try to clean it, you try to get rid of this resin, that's another problem, and that's being solved because you will never have to uh, use this 
while on the go, all you do is you replace the cartridges with a very easy thread on and thread off. Uh, and you close it and it's smell proof completely. That's so, wild. Uh, and on top of it, it's going to use our own charcoal filter inside. Well, I was just so, going to ask about that. So, oh, that, yeah. because it's going to use our charcoal filters. We have a line of people waiting for this one here to come out. <laughs> I just got in line, man. <laughs> I just got in line. Well, let me ask you this because one eaters are notorious for, depending on their design, they get hot as hell, some of them. Um, Yes, How this, do you one, solve this? this one doesn't because your typical one heater is very short. It's one, uh, one piece of aluminum. Uh, what we have, we have uh, removable cartridges uh, and a filter in between. So it still gets warm uh, if you smoke five of those pods. Uh, and by the way, we're going to call this X5 one heater because there are five uh, preloaded cartridges. And each cartridge cool. contains probably three times more than the typical one heater does. So it's, it's, it's actually we've solved quite a few problems. And this is a good example on how we approach the problems. We solve the issues for people. Smell proof, handling the flour. We have a very unique uh, tool allowing people to load flour because not a lot of people realize that a lot of us have uh, allergy to flour. Uh, every time when I touch flour, including myself, every time when I touch flour with my fingers and I get anywhere close to my face, I, get, I start sneezing. Yeah. Because I used, to, I used to get it well, when I was trimming. Right. <laughs> Whenever I trim a lot of cannabis, I'm like, oh my God, I'm itchy as hell. Yeah, your, your <laughs> eyes are, yeah, exactly. So we designed a little uh, silly scoop that you can scoop the flour from the grinder and put it in, in, a, in a pipe without touching the flour. Imagine all those girls with beautiful manicures. Imagine all the people with uh, some medical conditions that they cannot pinch. Uh, it, it solves a lot of problems. So this is how we approach every single device. We care about how they look. We care about, um, you know, how they function. But also, very importantly, every time we try to solve problems, this is the difference between professional inventors and amateur inventors. We want to solve problems for people. Right. Not just move a product. And, and that's a great segue into, because I wanted to ask you this, because, you know, it, sometimes it seems like the industry stagnates until I talk to you and I see your products, right? Which is, is there... Is there an innovation or lack of innovation with new hardwares in this industry? Like, it, again, I yeah, see the I same think, repeat, but then I hear you and I'm like, there obviously isn't because now you're solving the one hitter issue as well. Yes, I, I think there is a little bit of innovations going on, especially with oversaturated uh, uh, vaporizer market. But what they will not tell you is the reason why they think that vaporizers are safer, which is, by the way, not true, and I will prove it to you in a second, uh, because they're burning the flour at much lower temperature, which is 300 degrees, you know, 350 degrees. They just want to heat it up so they can get a little bit uh, going. But the problem is that those chambers where the temperature is, is much closer to your mouth than even in the pipes. So what happens, you still get the, the temperature that makes people cough, even with vaporizers. Got and it. we get the emails from people all the time. Because if you take a vaporizer, even a vape pen, and people take a deep uh, draw, they're going to cough because it's very close to you. And another issue with vaporizers, especially liquid vaporizers, is because the liquid is compressed. And when it gets inside your lungs, it expands. This oh. becomes gas and it expands. And your lungs... Are consists of very small, tiny air sacs. We call them avioles. And what happens is when you apply a lot of pressure on the inside, it stresses out those avioles. That's how you get emphysema, making little holes in your, in your avioles. So that's the real danger of vapes. So if you look at what doctors are saying, I know people don't believe it, but what, people, uh, what doctors are saying as well is vaporizers are just as bad as smoking. So it makes no difference. Uh, Obviously, when you're burning the temperature at much lower rate, it makes you feel like you are, it's much safer. But because it's much shorter distance to your throat and to, to your mouth, it's still producing the same temperature. With our pipe, when it's smoked correctly, with all the filtration that we allow people to use, it gives you about 100, 110 degrees Fahrenheit temperature at the entrance of the mouth. So it's like breathing hot air during yeah. the summer day. Uh, and that's the biggest difference. That's what makes Maze X pipe much better and safer than a lot of vaporizers out there. 
Well, I can tell you that I, I've seen the rave reviews about it. Um, haven't had a chance to experience one myself yet, but what was that like? So when, when you were working through that, obviously you were solving a multitude of issues by the sounds of it, but what was the eureka moment for that pipe specifically? Because that one seems to, is that one of your best selling products? It, it, it is uh, uh, the most profitable product for us, for sure, but it's not the best. We, we sell more uh, charcoal filters. We sell them by hundreds of packs per day. Wow. Uh, those charcoal filters that we sell, they can be used anywhere with joints, with, uh, uh, with uh, pipes, uh, or you can add our devices to any existing hardware that you have, whether it's a bong, whether it's a uh, glass pipe, we have different adapters that you can put on, on the back of your existing pipe and add our charcoal filter. And at a very low cost, you can have a much safer system. And that's what people are sending us. They say, we, I will never go back again because that makes no difference. And guess what else happens? When you smoke with lower temperature and when you smoke with a cleaner smoke, so your mind is not preoccupied with, am I going to get hit with a very hot resin? Is it going right. to burn my throat? Am I going to get something on my tongue? So because of that, your mind is more relaxed and it can feel much better taste in flour. It becomes cleaner. It becomes more purified. And, you know, we at, at some point, we actually had a slogan, taste the difference, because that's what a lot of our customers said. I taste the difference because it's much smoother. Now, imagine you eating a, a very hot food. Right, so when you put it a hot yeah, food, you, you no tongue, taste there. <laughs> you, you can't taste because now you're burning yourself. That's what, that's how our minds work. It's, it's right, a right, right. Okay. But when you lower the temperature, it's still warm and hot, but you lower the temperature just a few degrees. All of a sudden, you feel the taste of terpenes, whether you're eating uh, some hot, warm food. But when it's very hot, you can do it. The same happens with your with your smoke. Uh, uh, you know when people. Uh, uh, try our devices, they feel, they say that not only they're getting uh, uh, medicated and they get um, high, uh, they also enjoy the taste. Well, I wanted to ask about that because I, I wasn't sure how the, with the filtration, like does that, obviously it doesn't now that you've explained it, but it does it lower the taste, the flavor, but also is it, it's, it's filtering what exactly? Let's, let's clarify that. Uh, so what, uh, unfortunately unfo or unfortunately, I can't filter THC with a simple filtration that we introduce. If, so no if effect on could, TV, THC. If we could, yeah. I would get a Nobel Prize for filtering uh, <laughs> THC with a simple charcoal filtration or with our. And as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, the pipe filters the smoke by simply using physics. The technology is very simple because what's inside this pipe is a very long elaborate maze path on a very small and short pipe that we have. It's only five inches long. The inside track of the smoke is about 14 inches. So you compare a short pipe and a long pipe. So what happens is when the smoke, which is gas, passing through a longer distance, it has more opportunity to cool off, especially when you're slowly drawing it, compared to a very short pipe. And that's exactly what happens here. But on top of that, we have uh, designed this path so it constantly changes the direction. It's not a simple helix. It's a patented maze that allows the smoke to go back and forth, back and forth. So what happens is heavy elements in the pipe, like resin, which is, I'm talking about toxic resin, not the resin that, that we need. Yeah. Toxic resin, which is unburned flour, which is the oils, Unburned resin, by the way, it contains very little THC. It's a proven fact. Uh, so what happens, the pipe, because of the technology inside, it actually does not allow these heavy particles to travel a complete path because the particles lose the velocity. If you hit the wall and you're continuously doing it for several times, your heavy particles lose the velocity and they subside on the surfaces inside the pipe. And when you smoke this pipe for a week and you open it up, it's going to be filled with gunk and resin instead of your lungs. So that's what happens. And But we also paid attention for cleanability because for me, it was always a problem. With a glass pipe, you always have to shake it. You apply some, you boil it. Yeah, it's you, a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to ask about the maze. I'm thinking, wow, a lot of chambers, 14 inches down into this. Yes. How do you clean it? So. Yes. 
And, yeah. and the best part is cleaning. I mean, if you, again, if you read the reviews, you saw a lot of people commenting on how easy it is to clean because every component comes apart from this pipe, exposing all the dirty surfaces. It's right in front of you. There are no internal surfaces. You put it apart within two seconds, put it in a Ziploc bag with isopropyl alcohol for 10 minutes, and then you rinse it under uh, water with uh, uh, grease removing soap. It's, it's very easy and you dry it, and you put it back together. So it's very easy to clean. There's no internal surfaces, and uh, it's, it's actually designed. This was the design intent for us. How do we make it so it's, it's cleaned much easier? Yeah, that's wild. Have you, have you had any, I'm just thinking through, like with the innovation and technology, you know, there's a race, we joke in Canada, there's a race to the bottom, right? Which is who's bringing out the new product, what are the new SKUs, and maybe they should have just focused on something different. But do you ever get brands like cannabis producer processors ap- approaching you about your your filtration and that they could build that into the, any of their, I don't know the cost of them, so I can't say that, but into their, say their pre-rolls or anything that they're doing? The US has much drastically different rules when it comes to what we can do in Canada. But have you ever been approached where they're wanting to use your technologies Yes. And yes, license we, it within their brands? Have, yeah, we have several companies that approached us. We're still in talks with them. Uh, some people try to stay away from them because of the cost. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit more expensive to manufacture these technologies, especially charcoal filters. Our charcoal filters are a little bit more expensive than any other charcoal filters on the market, but uh, it gives you great advantage because there's a lot of charcoal filters on the market, but what they all have in common is they have charcoal pieces flying around inside. And what that uh, does is it produces a lot of charcoal dust. So it's like working on a coal mine where you're breathing with little dust from the charcoal because you shake them. So our technology is different inside. Our technology is nanocrystal, compressed nanocrystal minerals with a very high porosity inside each. So when you open up our charcoal filter, you'll find uh, not a single uh, particle of dust from charcoal. It's all round spherical balls wow. uh, with a very high porosity and they filter the smoke a lot better and that's what we get we get a lot of uh, uh reviews when people say this is the best charcoal filters they tried they can no, n- never go back some people canceling their uh you know refill uh, uh as i call them prescription on amazon where they yeah, get yeah. Uh, this every month and they switch to our products uh, it's better to pay a few cents more uh, but for a lot of companies, uh, they still have this um, understanding that cost is the most important feature here. For us, it is not. We are not afraid of higher cost because our value over exceeds this. Right. Well, that so makes a lot of sense. A, yeah, this is a very typical approach. We're not afraid of uh, cutting off um, uh, you know, the market with people who don't want to pay uh, a few extra cents. But for people who do, they realize that at the end, it actually gives them an advantage. Well, it, sound, it sounds like any of the brands that you would choose to work with or choose to want to work with you, those are obviously a premium type brand, right? Because they're wanting to put a premium, but also they understand the benefit of having safe product in market. So to me, I think of it as a win-win. I realize that you know economic pressures doesn't put everyone in the same demographic. I understand that. Um, but for myself that, you know, if I'm splurging on a certain premium product, give me the Rolls Royce. I want the Rolls Royce. That's exactly and to me. It sounds like your technologies are the Rolls Royce when it comes to this. That, that is exactly what we're trying to do. We are not trying to cut down on and, and, and cut the corners on developing products so we can make more profit and, and introduce products at a lower price. My focus is different. My focus is making it safer for people and let them decide whether it's for them or it's not. So, but if, if a person buys uh, an ounce for, you know, I don't know, $200 even, uh, you know, and if he's saying that he's not, he's willing to pay 10 cents for a filter instead of uh, 15. And that's the reason why he would choose it because of five cents. This makes no sense to me. Right. And that's another thing that we try to teach people when, whenever you're selecting your, uh, your next uh, cannabis device, Number one priority that I put and, and my kids put on a requirement is how safe it is. Is it safer than the next pipe? Is it safer than the next pre-roll? And talking about pre-rolls, we are the first company to release pre-rolls with real charcoal filters. Crazy. Not another company has this, and, and, and they're not expensive. So 
Uh, we sell them by boxes of 80 and uh, people just grabbing wow. them. We, we have a hard time keeping them on the shelf because it makes a huge difference when you're smoking with, uh, okay, you can take raw pre-roll, uh, uh, pre-rolls. And as they say, we have a filter tip. It has nothing to do with filtration. It's just rolled up paper at the end of the pre-roll. It's just keeping this, matter out of your mouth. Yeah, it's, that's all it's doing. Yeah, everything flies into your lungs. When we have pre-roll, when you smoke it, it is so smooth. It's like smoking a, a cigarette with a filter. Jeez. That's and wild. And it also lowers the temperature. So I'm going to continue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dominate this market because our value proposition is different. We value health. And, and that's maybe because my background is in the medical devices. I've done artificial heart systems. I've done a lot of uh, uh, COPD devices for congestion of obstructive pulmonary disease. I've done a lot of other pulmonary devices, spine reconstructive surgical instrumentation. Uh, we've done a lot of microvasive surgery. We've done orthopedics. We've done obstetrics, gynecology. The list goes on. Uh, and uh, for me, it's very clear that the value is in uh, is in a uh, healthy, uh, inhalation. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're, you're solving problems. We love that. Obviously. Um, let's remind everyone where distribution is. So available in the U S obviously. Um, but you can also order through the, the, there's a Canadian side, right? So you can order through the Canadian site. Well, it's available Canadian in Canada. Side, uh, we are addressing, this is a, a good question right now because, uh, we are opening an office in Toronto. Okay. Uh, awesome. Right now we ship all our Canadian, um, uh, uh, customers directly from Miami. Uh, and the problem with that is uh, the shipment is uh, expensive, anywhere from $25 to $45, $50, depending on the location. And on top of it, when we ship uh, UPS, UPS sometimes, although we put a gift on every shipment, oh, yeah. they still, they still <laughs> yeah. impose. And, and this, is, this is tells you how we think. We think about People. You're thinking about the consumer, yeah. You're thinking about the consumer. How can we deliver the product to them with a lot less uh, cost? But UPS uh, are bandits. UPS are horrible company when they start charging people <laughs> yeah. customs fees out of nowhere without any laws, without any regulations, although they're supposed to charge a specific amount. They just come up with uh, crazy. So we had a lot of returns from Canada. Oh, but man. we solved this problem. We found a way how to ship it with very minimal loss. Uh, but right now, we are starting to prepare our inventory in, um, in Toronto. Uh, we already have an office there. We already have a person who's going to be shipping this for us there. The orders are still going to come through our website. But it will determine automatically if it came from Canada. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. It's going to be shipped directly from our Canadian location. And we're doing the same thing for Europe next year as well, because we ship to Europe, we ship to Australia. Uh, surprisingly, Australia is a big market for us. I would say uh, it would be. People yeah. paying $80, $90 wow. for DHL deliveries uh, so they can just get our pipe. This is how uh, good good uh, story travels fast, right? Well, so I remember dealing try, with with Australia in the early days. So they are very medically focused, right? So if I go back eight years when we were starting to, I had customers that we were working with in the, in Australia and everything was governed from the medical side, regardless of which facet it touched. It was, is it safe? Are we EU GMP? Are we doing this properly? GACP. So it would only make sense that there would be a massive opportunity market in Australia for you. Yes. Yes. That's, that's, you're exactly correct. And, uh, you know, we gearing up, uh, you know, we're a small company, but we're doing really, really well. Uh, I don't want to throw numbers at you, but, uh, you know, we, we're doing really well and we grow in exponentially compared I to, love it. uh, last year we more than doubled this year. We get up uh, a lot and, uh, it's, 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 and we're going to continue developing products because it gives me tremendous satisfaction to know that <laughs> yeah. we're helping people and, uh, and maybe this is my uh, you know, my, my mind is telling me that this is important, but because of my background, because I, I've seen people being alive and doing better because of the devices that I, I've designed with my group, uh, you know, it's, it's very important to me, uh, to develop products basing them only, how do we make it safer? Because if, if you take any product that we release, every single one of them has a filtration and even including your, the dupe tube that you mentioned. 
Uh, it is so convenient for people to take this on a go. I use Duke Tubes every time I go out. I just put it inside. There is not a single company has Duke Tube uh, holders or joint cases that also introduce filtration. Yeah. Yeah, super unique. And, and I think that's where, you know, we look at it as, you know, you're you're a serial inventor. But I think when when you're getting the feedback and the testimonies coming in where it's that much better, that must just fuel and drive your ability to continue to innovate. So what's 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 next? I mean, you mentioned you're already, you know, patent pending right now on is it the X5? That's the one hitter. Is that yeah, correct? X5 one hitter because it has five five pods. Uh, we want to introduce people uh, to devices where you have to handle flour with hands a lot less. Mm, okay, very uh, so cool. That's, that's important. So we're working on a, a one-heater system. Uh, we're going to attack bongs after that. Uh, we also have an idea for a much better grinder. Mm, okay. Uh, because grinders have a lot of problems. Believe me, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with women <laughs> trying to rotate it, and then after a while, all of a sudden, it gets... So jammed, you can't even roll it. So there's a lot of problems to be solved. Uh, and uh, that's going to be next year. But we also attacked uh, our shipping uh, containers. So you would think that you only have to concentrate on, um, uh, you know, on a devices itself, but also when people receive um, uh, our products, I want them to really enjoy this process. When people open up our very discreet box, which looks white on the outside. On the inside, it's the whole story. Nice. It's a lot of colorful images. It's a small story about widgets, how it came to be about. It has surprise, surprises with uh, gift certificates inside, uh, gift cards. So every time a person receives the package, they just, they just love it because it gives them the smooth. We want people to experience. We're not selling the products, just the products. I want to sell people the experience the that's huge it's pleasure. so important experience. yeah as as steve jobs proved right as you know the unboxing experience and I, I don't know if that was the nexus but you proved that you can you can instill that sense of good purchase proper purchase and be happy about it because there is this you know the psyche and the psychology behind um you know wishing you hadn't purchased something and wes and i were just talking about this on our, our pre-show we you know received this care package it's the most beautiful care package in the world we open it we're excited but here's the thing even if the device is yeah. subpar and i'm not saying widgets any of the devices are by any means they sound of the most high quality that you can purchase but it will at least allow a little bit of room if the product isn't because you had that great unboxing experience but for you it sounds like you're hitting both points, which is crucial. Yes, exactly, exactly. And we also pay attention to customer service as well because uh, people are very surprised that when they reach out to us, it's not an automated uh, service. It's not somewhere in, in Asia, in India. Uh, it's right here, a live person. And when, when something happens, even when uh, shipping is not uh, done correctly and they lose the packages, which uh, postal service and UPS and other shipping companies always do, uh, what we do in this case, we just follow the cost. And because the customer is more important to us than the money, uh, we want to uh, create a widgets nation, uh, people who are part of our family, and we take care of them. Like, for instance, yesterday, uh, we shipped something uh, UPS, and they lost the package. And instead of uh, waiting for them to investigate, like a lot of companies do, let's wait, let's investigate. The customer is more important. We ship them the new set of products. We swallowed the cost, uh, and we will deal with UPS, but we want to make sure that the customer is satisfied. Yeah. No matter you what. Are, you're you're speaking language. our language. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, we, yeah. you know, Wes is world-class support. He uh, prides himself and keeps our company where it needs to be on customer support. And it's, how do you service the customer? The Lexus model, the case study, which is, if you get a customer, treat them like gold because they could be a customer for life. And it, I love that you're doing that. Listen, Michael... Uh, we could go on forever because it sounds, so. your story is incredible. The innovations are even more mesmerizing and amazing. You're good. Um, but listen, first, I need to say, stay safe in Florida, right? Okay. Uh, I could just imagine, I'm picturing your house or office and what kind of contraptions you may have going on. But outside of that, continued success. We're going to keep an eye on. We're super excited that you have a Toronto office opening and distribution in Canada will be that much more easy. So um, super, super excited about that as well. But we do appreciate you joining Legacies today. 
We know that the, you know, Milton's on his way, but it doesn't seem like it's going to phase you in any way whatsoever. We're going to fight it. Fight it. Well, we appreciate you. Thanks so much for joining Legacies, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the time with you guys. Of course. Breadstack e-commerce. It might be time to upgrade. All right. Welcome back, everyone. We're joined by Eugenio Garcia of Cannabis Now, founder and CEO, joining us from Chicago, even though you're based in Montana, correct? Correct. Yep. Thanks for joining Legacies, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yes. Today, I am in beautiful Chicago. I'm at the um, Benzinga Capital Conference. I spoke nice. on our panel yesterday and oh, cool. super stoked to be here with you guys today. That's awesome. Uh, well, when, I don't know if you're as stoked as we are because one, you've, you've had great success in the U.S. so far, but off, obviously, you know, transcends the U.S. But you're involved with a lot of stuff and we're trying to see if there's a glimpse of hope for Canada in some cases when it comes to, uh, you know, whether that's media, which obviously you're focused on that side, but also you're so ingrained in understanding of the industry that you would know what the challenges that we face here in Canada potentially are and some of those echoes out of the US, some hope, some some glimmer of possibility that we may have someday. But let's first start with uh, Cannabis Now, established 2010, is that correct? Uh, technically 2009, but we published our first magazine in 2010. I got it. Okay. All right. So walk us through what that was like. What was the lead up? Like, were you in the cannabis scene, you're, you just saw this opportunity. What was it? What was the eureka moment that you said, ah, I think I need to get into this space? Well, I think that the the legal business of cannabis really came into my awareness actually in 2004 when it became legal. I was uh, going to college uh, in a town called Bozeman, Montana. So I was going to Montana State University. And I was a political science uh, student at the time. And my roommate actually became one of the first providers uh, for cannabis in, under the medical program oh, in wow. 2004. I think Montana was the third or fourth state to have a medical program. And then um, over the next four to five years, uh, him and my brother-in-law, so um, family kind of an, uh, relationship, they started to uh, cultivate cannabis under oh, cool. under the okay. medical law in Montana, and I became an advisor for for um, for my my family uh, my family relationships, uh, small things like how to open a dispensary, um, understanding you know, small strategy, and I actually uh, my my girlfriend and wife now so my girlfriend at the time was living in San Francisco right across uh -huh. the the street from Haight and Ashbury. Which is okay. like a classic kind of stoner uh, <laughs> legacy zone in San Francisco. And my actually dealer, my dealer at the time, lived like on that eight in Ashbury like street. Oh wow! So I'd go there a few months and like like I didn't know the guy. I just like I got a cell phone from a friend, and they're like, "This is the, this is the guy in San Francisco." <laughs> yeah. I would only see him in his apartment, and I worked during the day, so it was usually like a nighttime kind of a deal. Um, and uh, it was one of those classic things where, like, you couldn't just go get the weed and leave. You had to like sit down. And, like, you had to like, <laughs> you had to, yeah. you had to talk about his like fish, and, like pet his dog, and like, dude, this is Pineapple Express through and through. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just seeing like, Pineapple Express. <laughs> smoke a few joints, you know. Yeah. Um, it was like a 40 minute thing. So I had just finished one of those deals, and I was hanging on the corner of Hate Mash Ashbury, like literally on the corner, and um, on the ground discarded on the ground, there was a newspaper magazine called the West Coast Leaf, okay. um, which was a super heady political, NorCal medical type of a journal. And because my brother-in-law was growing cannabis back in Montana, I was always trying to find literature to bring back to him, whether it's in Barnes and Noble or it's, you know, wherever. So I brought it back to him and we were smoking a joint um, in the winter. And when I brought it back to him and he said, he turned to me and he said, hey, um, we should start a, well, he's technically he said there should be a medical journal for cannabis. And, you know, I'm an entrepreneurial spirit type of dude. And I'm always thinking every day I think of a new business. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but every now and again, one hits you. And it's like, you know, and um, 
I had that moment and with, with, um, with his little brother, Chris Venuzzi, who owned the dispensaries uh, in the cannabis business, uh, he, he angel funded the, the startup capital and co-founded Cannabis Now magazine with me in Montana as a medical Rocky Mountain political focused magazine. So it was going to be Montana, like Wyoming, Washington, Idaho, kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, and we went into business. And and actually, two years later, um, it, or two and a half, three years later, in 2012, Montana became one of the only states to ever go backwards on their cannabis law. So I know there's been like different restrictions and stuff, but literally they went from having a thriving marketplace where uh, someone with a license, a provider's license, could have unlimited amount of patients, customers. We were limiting them to three. What? So virtually everybody went out of business. And um, I was actually living in Berkeley, California at the time, working at Whole Foods Market. So I was involved in the emerging market of the organic movement. And I had co-founded a specialty foods company with my twin brother and sister. My twin brother is a chef. And uh, so I was working on multiple projects and I was kind of flying back to Montana to work on this magazine. And so we thought we were done, but... Um, I don't have a personality for, you know, giving up. <laughs> and at the time, Steve D'Angelo was running Harborside, which was the largest dispensary in the world. And he had gotten these amazing photos taken of him by a very famous photographer. And in Oakland, just down the street, um, there was a guy named Ed Rosenthal. Ed, who, yeah, cut his book right here on my shelf. There you go. <laughs> the guru of ganja. And I convinced Ed Rosenthal to give me a bunch of amazing photos of cannabis, which at the time we called popcorn, and to give us some editorial support for those. And then I convinced Steve D'Angelo to sit for an interview and to give us the photos from his photo shoot. So we had this amazing cover, and then we had a bunch of popcorn inside. <laughs> That's a perfect and, recipe. <laughs> and so um, we made a third magazine without knowing where to distribute it. And we ended up sending it to Barnes and Noble and saying, hey, this is the next new normal magazine for cannabis. And they ordered, I think, 4,000 and they had an 80 to 90% sell through, which is, I don't know if you know wow. the publishing world at all, it's, the average is like 30% sell through. Jeez. So it, it absolutely crushed. And um, over the years, we were, we were the first uh, cannabis uh, app to be allowed on iTunes uh, for our magazine. We were the first cannabis magazine uh, to be distributed in the airports. We're in 80, 89 airports nationwide in Hudson News. Now we have a social media following of almost 4 million. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to ask you about that. So I'm going to come back to the 4 yeah, million and, and, because and, and, that's and, huge. And so that's that's like the origin story and and, and here we are today. So yeah. what what year approximate timing was it when you had sent the, the publication to Barnes & Noble? 2012, 2011, 2012. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and the Cali medical was the, that medical market opened up or le legalized. Uh, I use air quotes a lot when I speak to this it was around 96, 94. Yeah. Early. Like they had a medical program for a long okay. time. And of course they were one of the first states to yeah. go So 15, 16 years. So like, was that the typical demographic of a Barnes and Noble consumer? Like, cause I mean, you know, in my, my days growing up in those nineties, anyways, it was the high times, you know, you talk about pop porn, right? Like yeah. that's really all that we saw during those times, was, but it wasn't. Um, there was only three cannabis magazines at the time on the shelves in Barnes and Noble. There was high times, uh, a magazine called weed world, which is okay. really an international seed magazine. And then there was actually a magazine called Treating Yourself, which was a Canadian publication. Really? That, okay. was, that was in Barnes & Noble. And that was it. And I was always in Barnes & Noble because uh, my brother-in-law was always asking me for cannabis literature. And I went there and I was like, why is there only three cannabis magazines? And it's a booming market. There's only three magazines. And um, yeah. So obviously the, the success of that distribution helped pave the way to where you are, but at what point did you take to, you, you know, cause if I think back 2012, I mean, you know, Twitter's opening up, like, you know, the, the social is just becoming the scene, obviously Facebook had, had existed and that sort of thing, but you're, you're now embracing a social audience of around 4 million. What was, what was that like in the early days compared to now? Because now we know, 
oh God, don't mention cannabis. You don't show nug shots. Your accounts can get taken down and your shadow ban. What was that like in the early days of building that audience? You know, it, it, it's an interesting question, actually. I, I don't reflect on it often, but um, well, I don't reflect on the fact that it was it's such a dangerous thing now. I, I don't think back then I was too worried about it. Um, I know that my, my first employee uh, was my girlfriend at the time, and she was our social media manager. She built our first website. Uh, she had her own business. And um, now she's our, our CTO um, and my wife and my partner. Um, but at the time, she, she was kind of the one that understood social media and really provided me with the inspiration and the support to focus on social media. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, just between me and you, I guess, um, there, there, I took a strategy with her. Um, to we looked at all of the at the time it was Facebook right there was there right was, that's right I don't know what year Instagram came about but we weren't we weren't on Instagram yeah Instagram was originally the the photo sharing or whatever it was but I think Twitter was starting to show its face anyways around that time 2010 2009 anyways so what we did was we looked at as many cannabis accounts as possible. And at the time, there was, there was quite a bit on Facebook. Um, it must have been over 20. And there was like three or four specific ones that they just posted random, wild stoner stuff. But we were really, really focused on which ones went viral. And we emulated them with slightly more progressive and normal imagery and or videos. And uh, so we took their playbook made it a little bit nor more normal, but still viral, and, um, and then posted it aggressively and consistently on Facebook. And there was about a two-year period where their algorithm was so friendly to any kind of content uh, that it just it went from you know, 500 followers to 4 million in, in about two years. Because I mean, we, were, we were posting, I have the analytics like, screenshotted now, but we would post a viral um, video and it would reach like 15 million people. Man. Just insane numbers. And, and since then, they've changed the algorithm and, so it's, and, and they're negative against cannabis. So it's a different environment. But it was a moment in time that we were able to, to get in that helped us. So, so would- yeah, obviously, those early days and, and that following, helping to build your brand and name for yourself in the industry was important. And we know, like nowadays, it's, you know, even our some of our younger accounts as we try to grow them, it's, <laughs> you're pushing, you know, a wagon full of rocks up a hill every day. And then, you know, sometimes they're falling out. It's impossible sometimes. Yeah. Um, I, so I actually, I, I talked about it yesterday on the panel about social media and, and, and the, point that I was trying to make to the crowd, which I'll, I'll tell to you, is um, I've actually encouraged my clients and the people that I work with not to do social cannabis social media, but to create, but, but to aggressively do social media, similar to maybe like what you guys are doing with your other brands and ventures. But so create a social media account that is very, very specifically lifestyle and figure out a way for it to go viral. Right. So and you then, just put us offside in Canada. <laughs> and then, and then no what, lifestyle. <laughs> um, well, whatever it is. like. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Well, and that's the thing. That's one of the reasons we are excited to be able to talk to you is that, you know, there's obviously drastic differences between what is allowed, what, be that, geez, I don't know, product, product innovation, distribution, marketing, the regs around marketing, um, you know, just legalization. You know, you're going state to state to state. And we want to get to which party is going to be the best for cannabis as well. Cause I, you know, we don't get a lot of uh, opportunities to speak with Americans on the, on the show. We're opening that up obviously, but man, there's just so much. I could talk to you probably for about five hours on this. Um, but you know, so those, those, those clients that you work with, you know, you can, you can take that approach, which is, you know, lifestyle. You don't have to have you brought something up, right? And it's that stoner. So in those days, there was that stoner culture, which is crucially important. That's where, you know, cannabis was born. Um, but it almost seems like it's segmented where you have the stoner culture and then you have the kind of curious individuals and then another set of group or demographic in the center that 
is hyper-focused on understanding what are the regulations, what's going on in the different states, what new product innovations are happening, what does it look like from a medical standpoint, um, versus high THC for the best value I can get. How do you target that demographic? Because it would seem that the vast majority of your concept sits, or, or your content sits in the middle of that. It's not stoner. It's not necessarily kind of curious, although you have enough content to help educate, but it's that middle line demographic of they just want to be super knowing of what's going on and informed in the industry. Yeah, we we try to have an edi- editorial north star where we we want to we want to make sure that we target the largest amount of people um, with a very specific content that they will accept. And so what okay. that means is, um, let, let's just say. 90% of the population that uses cannabis are not your traditional stoners or like heavy aficionados because not everyone's a stoner that smokes all day. But like like 10%, that, that's their DNA. That's how they live their life, their music, their, their everything. That's like what they're all about. Um, if you take that content and you give it to the other 90%, they're going to reject it. But if you give the content to the 90% that they will absorb, the stoners will not reject it. They they might not um, they might not participate at the level that you want them to, but they won't reject it. They they right, will still right. they will still participate. So then that you're makes reaching, sense. You're reaching a hundred percent of the potential customer, and that's been our north star. So sometimes, unfortunately, we we miss a little bit of the fun stuff. We li- miss a little bit more of the edgy stuff um, because we're, for lack of a better word, more vanilla or or uh, digestible. But it's we're we're trying to be really really early in the type of entertainment and education that we think is going to be the future. And that makes a lot doing. of sense. Well, kudos on that. That's uh, uh, first of all, kudos on having a north star. <laughs> other than in tech, when I was in tech, we didn't really talk about north stars and other companies that I was at. Um, so I like that. What um, what do you feel is the biggest advantage? for federal legalization. I know there's a, there's a myriad of opportunities, but the biggest advantage, because we hear it, I mean, you got to take it from our side too, right? We're Canadian, we're looking at what could happen. And I'll give you some foresight to what what's discussed, which is, you know, if the US were to federally legalize cannabis tomorrow, a lot of our brands in Canada or companies in Canada, they're going to be screwed. Meaning US capital can move in. There's some larger companies here in Canada that maybe not so well capitalized and they're struggling because of the last six years of BS that they've been dealing with. But um, what do you see as the biggest advantage, if you can pick one, to federal uh, legalization? The advantage for the consumer or for businesses? For businesses in this case. Um, I think the advantage to federal legalization, and, and forgive me, but I, I often think macro, like okay. uh, yep. global, uh, but it the U.S. is such a dynamic player in the global scene that when the federal, when the U.S. federal government goes legal, it will set precedent for the entire world, which not only will open up North American commerce and interstate U.S. Co- commerce, but definitely Canadian to U.S. commerce. I have clients that can't fly back and forth between Canada and the U.S. and be publicly um, out there. For like the CEOs of companies can't do interviews or put their face out there because they'll get hassled going back and forth yeah. in, in yeah. between the Canadian border. Um, and so, you know, federal legalization for businesses, it, it's it's absolutely everything. I mean, could, could you could you imagine starting any company and having to start a new factory in every single state? That That's always blowing my to, mind. It, it, I, it, I, I'm just <laughs> dumbfounded thinking, you know, because there, we know that there is some product movement, whether that's legal or illegal. Um, but that exactly, you know, I, I know some of the Dabstrack folk and I'm like, w- you have to do what? <laughs> like to or operate in another state, you have to do what? And, and, and also like a little bit more, I guess, esoterically, federal legalization will create what we've felt like has been a boom, but actually is just the kernels of, of the beginning. Yeah, into an explosion of innovation. So right now, ninety eight percent of innovation is not happening in the cannabis space because entrepreneurs and the super creative future business owners and founders they're not even in the cannabis space because it's such a tough industry to like it, it, it's the wild west. 
So like scrappy outliers have come in, um, but innovation just isn't happening. And, and, and medical, medical studies are hampered and, and consumers having access to cannabis to give the feedback to the entrepreneurs of what they want is, is at such a, a low percent right now because it's not federal legal. So when, when federal legalization comes, uh, the benefit to the business will actually be the creation of a real market. There, there is not a market right now. It's a, it's a complete hybrid, two hands behind your back, shackled by chains and underwater. Yeah. We still feel that way in Canada, even with federal legalization. <laughs> well, you're federally legal, but you have insane restrictions. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and that's where... So do you feel, though, with U.S. federal legalization, do you feel that some regions, countries are holding on the fact that the U.S. hasn't legalized yet? So meaning, you know, the slow adoption in some of these different countries, I still consult in Europe and it's like one day Germany's doing this the next day they're doing this. Oh, Thailand's coming online. Wait, hold on. They're not coming online. Um, it's just been really strange to watch this considering in Canada, it's been six years now coming out in the six year anniversary. But with the evolution of technology, uh, human consciousness, education, et cetera, et cetera, the, the, um, the U.S. becoming less impactful than it was maybe 30 years ago as like a world leader. Um, I think the dynamic has changed globally, but absolutely. I mean, once the U.S. dollar can participate in a cannabis industry federally um, and the government will protect the businesses that are, that are operating, I absolutely think it will set precedent for the entire globe. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. It does make sense. So without getting your political flair necessarily, which side is better for the cannabis industry? Is it the Republicans like the or the, the Democrats? The system? That's that right. Person? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think like, are you, you want me to go to like the political candidates? I want you, yeah, I want you to go wherever you want to go, man. <laughs> We're just having a chat. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I dig it. Um, I would say that between Republicans and Democrats, I, I really don't see, I wouldn't pick a, a horse to ride on. I think they have different positives and negatives about political parties. Um, and I think that there's this emerging independent um, thing that's happening quietly with voters and, and the future of politics. Uh, that might be for a different podcast. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I know what you're talking about, but, though. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes down to... Um, former President Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris. I think Kamala has the better opportunity to push um, the cannabis industry forward. I think that she has already proven her desire um, to support uh, people who are, are getting out of jail for nonviolent drug offenses. Um, and, um, you know, there is an argument that Trump is more pro-business and he's also more whatever is good for money making and or makes him look good um, might be like what he will put a flag on. But I also don't think, you know, like, just to be very like basic about it, he doesn't drink alcohol. He doesn't he doesn't have any past in consuming narcotics or like uh, stuff like that. Like he, it's not part of his consciousness. So he's not going to put a lot of he's going to. He's going to defer to the states, is my, sure, sure. my opinion. And, and the states just are all over the place. They take a lot longer to get things done. Um, I don't vote. I don't vote for presidential candidates based on cannabis. But um, I think I think the Democrats, to answer your question, um, will push it forward faster. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think the Democrats need something. They, they need a lot more than just cannabis, but they need to stack up wins. And I think they will see cannabis legalization as a win for them. Yeah, yeah. And just from an outside view, I look at it as, because you mentioned it already, like Trump doesn't, you know, he doesn't consume anything like that, that we know of. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but at the end of the day, he's about business and businesses have taxation and taxes help do a lot of things. And that's the only reason I looked at it from that. Not that I'm pro either really necessarily. I love the theatrics of everything going on, especially as a Canadian watching it. But um, for me, I just looked at it as business, but you know, and in, in Canada, 
we took that approach somewhat, right? Which is, you know, federal legalization, here's the Cannabis Act, here are the regulations that you need to operate by that enact it. And then provincially, we want you to understand your own distribution and figure that out yourselves, which has been just an absolute shit show in some cases. Um, I get why, but at the same time, you wish at a federal level, there was a little more responsible control over what's going on so that, I mean, everyone's got their hands in it, right? So there's a lot of taxation, which we know, um, probably for almost every dollar, there's 70 cents spent on taxes for uh, at the consumer, right? Or consumer level. So it'd be very interesting because I mean, right now, how many states right now are legal? Um, I think that there is like 36 that have 36. some kind of cannabinoid legal laws, whether it's low uh, CBD or low THC. Um, and there's a lesser number that is recreationally okay. uh, available. I think it might be 22, 18 to 22. Right, uh, right. Where it's like a dull use, walking with your ID and grab some weed. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think that it's tough. I I believe in safety for the consumers. That and and if like in our food system, not in the U.S., but in, in a lot of other countries, there's really really great protection for consumers with like food dyes and, and pesticides. And um, I'm actually not sure how it is in Canada with that, but I really I welcome federal protection uh, on the quality of cannabis for the consumer. Um, but it, it's really tough to see the Canadian government being, um, so like strangling the market and not allowing it, It's such an opportunity for Canada. Canada was, this is, they, this is like, what I mean. they're like, it was like this maverick country that was like, you know what, even though like our big brother, the U S or whatever is, le- is, is not legalized that we're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was like an aha moment for for Canada and it just hasn't come to fruition and it's so disappointing. I guess I guess on that note, you know, should the USA federally legalize, you know, what what are the failures that you've seen uh, that you're aware of at least in Canada that you wish would not come over to the US when they legalize and and are there any wins that we've had that you see that's like, yeah, that you know, that that should be part of that legalization as well. Well, Good you've question. allowed you've allowed companies to be publicly traded. And, and that is absolutely key. I mean, the fact that uh, we're here at this Benzinga conference, there's entrepreneurs raising capital, there's investors raising, and, and guess what? The number one question either said out loud or behind every investor's mind um, is, hey, if I give you a million dollars, when am I going to get it back and how are you going to do that? And for, for a lot of companies, it's, you know, the end goal, if you're going to be a big company, is to go public um, and to allow the public markets to invest in your company. And so Canada you know, was super early in that. And a lot of US companies are listed in Canada for that reason. Um, but the, the thing that I hope and pray does not come over to us is the, the marketing and advertising restrictions. And it might seem like a small thing, but actually it's everything. Oh, it's huge. It's no, every- that's huge. I mean, Th- that is everything. Uh, You're hitting the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah, there, it is absolutely everything. Um, uh, are you familiar with the brand Liquid Death? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Like water in a can that is now worth $1.5 billion. Crazy. They, they, they could not have done that without marketing. And no. So, I mean, Apple, Nike, I mean, you name it. Like products are products. I mean, look, I got a, I got a Diet Coke right here. Like, yeah, it tastes good, but you know what? It, it, it's marketing that, that gets people emotional about a product. That's right. To stay connected to it, to pull it off the shelf with impulse, to understand it. Um, it, it it's half the battle. And without that, like, it's really tough. Yeah. It's- how, how, much, how much loyalty do you have to what kind of tomatoes you buy? Is, Zero. Is, is there a brand of tomatoes you buy? Zero. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, we, we've been saying this for the longest time. It's, you know, there's obviously there's challenges across, but excise tax being one, double dipping, ghost taxes, that's huge. <laughs> but the marketing is, you know, and, and I think the part that really burns us the most is the fact that when you're applying for your licenses, it's how will you market? There is a section in the application about how, what is your, and, and I've said like, why do they even have that? Why don't they just tell us how to market? Because you're not allowed, Right. And the vast majority, what happens in this case is because of that 
marketing restriction, the marketing is done to the retail level only. So it's a lot of B2B. It's a lot of to the bud tender, which I get it. I, I get it. But it's also the state that we're in. So until that there is reform, we're just not going to see it, right? Alberta is doing okay. They're starting to allow, um, you know, certain cannabis brands and consumption at events, like you know, larger, more popular type events. But sure. I mean, one of our one of our clients, Papa's Herb. Oh, just, Papa's Herb, yeah. They, they just went out. They're 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 in Canada. They're also a U.S. company. They went out and did a major major activation. Um, there was a big comedy festival that they were at, and there was like a huge music event uh, that they, they invested heavily in and got all sorts of positive feedback. Yeah. And, and, and it would have been in Alberta. Um, but you know, the unfortunate situation, you can't do that across the rest of them. Just like, you know, in certain, and I want to get to this, I want to understand your, the CBD wellness side of what you're doing. If you're still doing that, (laughs) because you've got so much on the go, the serial entrepreneur. Um, but take for instance, you know, some of the maritime provinces out here, um, they can, the, the brand producer can own retail as well. And not all provinces allow that either. So at least there's some connect Right in in lieu of having some sort of proper marketing allowance or advertising, they can at least connect to the brand somehow. Um, but the vast majority of provinces, it's a no no. Right, like take Ontario for instance. When we first were talking about adult use, it was only going to be online through Ontario Cannabis Store. That's it. And then change of government in Ontario, and it's no no no. We're going to allow stick and brick now too, or brick and mortar. But OCS Ontario Cannabis Store, and then it changed again to well, no, maybe we'll we'll allow private as well. Yeah, we'll allow private, and we're going to do it through a lottery. And then uh, no, hold on, anyone can get one. Like seriously, that's the fucking world we live in up here, which is, and that's just the province, right? Um, but also the OCS, which I'm sure you're aware because you're hyper aware what's going on globally with cannabis, is Ontario Cannabis Store is also the wholesale distributor and a competitor. Right. Which That's, it's like an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Um, what are you doing? Uh, I want to get to this because in Canada, we have this massive uproar going on around CBD and wellness, right? So one, we can't state wellness unless you're on the medical side and you have to be a health professional to state that, right? So you can't say wellness. There was actually um, dispensaries in Ontario here, wellness on the window, shielded. They were told to take it down through the AGCL, okay? But- and I'll get to that, but I want to understand what are what are you doing in the CBD wellness space? And from what I understand, it may be just Montana now if you're doing it. But so we actually started a retail store, uh, which is now closed, but we started it in Beverly Hills. In, oh wow! In two thousand uh, early two thousand nineteen, um, in in Beverly Hills, and it was predicated on a model where we didn't want to have security guards. We didn't want to have um, scanning of, of IDs. Of course, to show your ID, uh, we, we had a policy of 21 and over for our store. Yep. Yep. Um, but we had high quality accessories like bongs and vaporizers. We had clothing. Half of our store was an art gallery and a cafe. Wow. Um, and we, we sold CBD flour. We sold CBD gummies, CBD vape. And we were, we were probably the first major retailer in the U.S to go at it in, in that way. Um, and then COVID happened, uh, which was survivable, not great, but survivable. And, but really what caused the retail unit in our plan was to do flagship stores all over the country in major Chicago, LA, Dallas, New York, Miami, and to have these major, we had a real estate partner who had major real estate holdings all over the country. And we were going to pick their their flagship locations and put flagship stores in all of these locations Very in cool. the US and then back it up with a website. Um, and when when COVID happened in LA, it also was um, right behind it was Black Lives Matter. Oh, and, okay. And the civil unrest that came with that caused riots all over the country. And in LA, right, right where our store was, was a massive, massive civil unrest moment. And our store, along with a bunch of other dispensaries, was targeted uh, as a dispensary. And we, you know, we lost over a million dollars worth of investment in, in that one night. And uh, we actually rebuilt. We did a GoFundMe campaign. People stepped up. We rebuilt. And um, we, we reopened our doors and actually continued to operate for almost a year. But COVID lasted so long. 
that um, what ended up happening was the crime in Los Angeles skyrocketed and every single store within a mile of us was being robbed at gunpoint during the day. Wow. And it became this crazy uh, anarchy kind of environment where um, we would have had to hire an armed security guard with a bulletproof vest 24 hours a day to sit in the store. Jeez. Not only is that expensive, but it was not the environment that we wanted for community. I mean, we had music activations, we had DJ parties, we had thought leadership going on. It was really supposed to be this like oasis, urban oasis, um, kind of like what the consumption lounges are starting to feel like now. Um, so we ended up closing it. Um, and now uh, we are trying to figure out where that type of we will reopen a brick and mortar store and we're actually launching an e-commerce store in the next few weeks. Um, but there's an emerging psychoactive hemp industry now. Right. And right. There's also this THCA flower um, and a bunch of other cannabinoids that will get you super, super high that are federally legal, which guess what? It's to the tune of $30 billion. A lot of people are arguing, which is the same exact size as the $30 billion state regulated market. So there's this civil war going on within what gets you high industry. Yeah, yeah. In the US. So we're trying to figure out where we want to operate within that. So it's a very interesting moment. Man, you, wait, as soon as you started bringing that up, I'm like, wow. Because, you know, so our early days, cannabis mavericks, they, some of them, not all, um, they shifted to, you know, Canada is online with the MDMA now and psilocybin and how are we going to figure this out and clinical research studies happening. But as soon as you start talking about that, I'm like, oh my God, that's a complete other world, um, even though it's attached. But so, and when did, because you have Hemp Magazine too, is that right? Yep. Yeah. So in 2017, uh, I founded Hemp Magazine, but Hemp Magazine, it was definitely supported and a little bit of the um, inspiration behind it was because we were getting inundated by CBD companies to advertise in Cannabis Now. And I kind of wanted additional real estate, but also a deferred focus. I didn't want the Cannabis Now magazine to be overwhelmed by CBD advertisers and or conversation. I, I was like, okay, we need to have a separate focus for this. And originally, it was going to be just a digital website uh, for that. But with the 2018 Farm Bill, which legalized hemp growing in the in the U.S., I said, okay, there needs to be a completely separate platform just for hemp. But industrial hemp is ultra, ultra, ultra early. And okay. it's a very, very limited, but probably going to be even bigger than cannabis one day industry um, and trying to figure out how do I continue to express a hemp media company while excluding the psychoactive hemp? <laughs> yeah. And how do we how do we put the psychoactive hemp into the cannabis conversation? It's a it's a it's a wild moment right now. Yeah. So you you touched on industrial hemp. Where are we going with industrial hemp? What is what is the holdup? What is you know? Because I'm thinking back to. I mean, God, it's got a 140 year history. You know much better than I do, but I. You know, is it the Declaration of Independence made of hemp paper? Is that correct? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Of course. It is. Absolutely. So the is the paracord and you name it. Yeah. So many things and, you know, the first flags, of course. Um, right. Look, it, it's not just because I own a hemp magazine, truly. Uh, hemp and its industrial uses will be one of the most dynamic and impactful things to affect the planet and economy in the last 500 years. I mean, we're talking industrial revolution, the internet boom. Um, there, when, when hemp comes online globally, it will fundamentally change everyone's life from, from protein in the food to building material to textiles and paper. It is absolutely a revolutionary thing. I mean, look, I love cannabis. Cannabis is amazing. I love to get high. I think it's a very, very powerful plant. I think the medical um, uses for cannabis have even yet to be uh, discovered and or and or expressed. But um, but cannabis cannabis is like the dolphin compared to the blue whale of 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 hemp. 
So what's the what's the holdup though? Like what what is what is taking so long for us to realize? Because it was booming for a certain amount of time. Well, booming, but it was doing well. I, I see in Europe, you know, you talk building materials even outside of textiles, like the advances and in innovations I'm seeing in Europe alone. Um, but again, it's. It's minuscule compared to what can happen because everything is so controlled. So here, here, here's how. Here's my take on it. Anybody can pretty much put a seed in the ground or a clone and water it and get high like that. It's it. Look, it takes a lot to grow craft cannabis and, and like sure. really be a professional. But like, there's there's um there's a wonderful seed company that we also work with called Royal Queen Seeds and they sell I, I'm more, familiar with them. Yeah. They sell more seeds globally to home growers than anybody else. A massive company and they sell to people who water their plant and get high. Uh you can't just water a plant and build and make building material. Right, you right. You need you need 10 million dollar pieces of equipment to turn it into the material that it's going to be. You need distribution, you need factories, you need technology. There's a lot of capital investment needed, and the laws need to be like favorable. Um, it really, it's an awareness of the long-term capital uh, potential of investing in the hemp space that is holding it up. And it, it's really, it. I was having this conversation last night. I was walking from dinner to the hotel, talking to one of the largest investors in the space who is really passionate about hemp, and he literally asked me the same exact question: like, "What is the holdup?" And I, I said, I said it's, not, it's not that there isn't money. There's trillions of dollars of money out there, um, but there is not enough media talking about the potential and the excitement about the future of hemp to reach those potential investors. They don't, they don't even know it exists. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. And, and you know, because we look at it right now, so to bring it back to CBD for one second, and then we'll look at that is, you know, in Canada, CBD, we're... <laughs> we're pushing that CBD should not be regulated, but not the same as THC products and therefore would have the ability to be sold into health um, focus stores, right? Or wellness, because the vast majority of those consumers right now, at least in Canada, they're needing to go to dispensaries or they have a medical recommendation and they're shopping online with a medical platform. But those vast majority of that demographic or populace that are looking for those products, they're not going to your corner store right your dispensary to purchase because they don't know it exists there for one uh, again marketing and, and the ability to advertise and promote the product makes it difficult so it's under consideration right now where health canada may reform but you know consultation after consultation after consultation they never get anywhere with it um, but we're hopeful that we will see that so you know from our standpoint what we do as media is try to be that voice, unite voices, bring it together, make people aware this is going on because at the end of the day, you'd be surprised how few, well, you know, <laughs> but how few understand the challenge and what the issue is with it um, and how and why these companies are failing. So to bring light to industrial hemp and the opportunity of it, that makes a lot of sense that media would have to come on board with it, but not just, you know, cannabis hemp focused media either, though, I would assume it needs to be more widespread. Let me, give you, let me give you some context here. Um, you know, at the trade show that I'm at right now, there's maybe 2,000 people. And it's, the, it's a, the smaller version of this trade show. And they probably have, I think they have four a year or they have a huge one in Miami. Um, uh, MJ BizCon, which is the largest cannabis conference in the world, has like 20,000, 15,000, 20,000 people. The Champs Trade Show uh, has 15, 20,000 people that come to it, which is an alternative trade show that has tobacco, but also a lot of cannabis and hemp activity now. Uh, I'm going to a hemp summit in Montana next week, which is being put on by one of the largest hemp companies in the space and is um, the largest gathering for hemp industry players. There might be 500 people there. Whoa. That, that's the context of where we're at. Is it just not like what, what's, I don't understand why I, it, I'm, it's like, like, when did you, when did you first get on a computer that connected you to the internet? 1995, maybe. Oh, geez. Uh, 90. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's about the right. Yeah. 95, 94, 95 is when I bought my first, my own computer. That yeah. was, yeah. So it would have been that. So, so it, in the context of that, the cannabis industry is like in 2005 
of where that like timeline is from when the internet started to like where it was in 2005. That's where cannabis is. The hemp industry is like 1994. Like, like, like <laughs> there's, there's a bunch of geeks who have figured out that you can like talk to each other electronically and like send email and figure it out. But it's like a handful. Uh, but it's going to change the world. If you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Or I'm going. Yeah. I like that. Well, it's hope and opportunity at least. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, no, I, so I, I would, I would actually argue that if like, I don't know what the future of cannabis is besides like, it's really fun to smoke a joint, but I guarantee hemp is going to change the world. It is, it is one of the most powerful industrial plants. on the Yeah. Plant. I, I a hundred percent agree with you. hundred percent agree. So cannabis now, um, as of right now you have, there's global readership is distribution only in the U S as print or is that we're, we're happening very, across? very focused in distribution in the U S um, the only time that you will find a print magazine, uh, internationally besides Canada, we do distribute about 10 to 20% of our magazines in Canada, uh, is, um, if we go to a trade show or an event to do oh, okay. a special distribution, we, we are looking for European expansion. We are looking for Latin American expansion. Um, of course our, our digital, our digital activity is, is globally consumed. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, when, so when you're curating that content, is it, are you focused mainly, you know, I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> old days of newspapers, right? You had what's going on locally. And then there may be a small section of what's going on in the world. W w how are you curating your content for a global cannabis market? So from time to time, we have done like international focused issues where it's like not as, as much a special edition, but it is the focus of that issue. Um, in every magazine and also in one of our departments, our editorial focuses, there is an international beat, if you will. So okay. in every magazine, we try to have at least one story that is internationally focused. Uh, we like to have a certain percent of our digital content be internationally focused. But yes, the, the conversation is focused on mainly North America and the US as the bedrock. And a lot of that is actually, it's not so much like that the conversations are different, but they're different global regions are in different stages of their evolution in the, of, of the consumer. So the, they want different things. And also there's language barriers. So <laughs> find, find, yeah. finding partners so you can publish in German or Spanish, um, you know, it, it changes things. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I was just thinking, as you were saying that, I'm thinking, well, it's the U.S. Everyone pays attention to what's going on in the U.S. I could just imagine if there was a, you know, Canadian news source or, or publication trying to make its way to the world, maybe, but pick one from, I don't know, the, another country or region. It's, eh, you know, yeah, everyone pays attention know, to what's going on in the U.S. I think it's actually like the, it's more of like the English language. I actually think that is like the, the gravity there. Um, so many people in other countries speak English as a, as a second or third language. So, uh, I mean, when I travel internationally and ask people what their favorite songs are, it, it's 90%. Like, the big favorites are ones in English. And even if they don't know what they're talking about, they're like, they, <laughs> yeah. they love, English is, is it's such a, it's such a, um, a straightforward communication uh, medium. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. Well, listen, Eugenio, I know you've got a lot on the go. Um, continued again. success. I, I enjoyed it. Oh, it's 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 a blast. We appreciate you taking time. I know we've got other uh, friends that are down there as well, hopefully raising some capital to bring back to Canada because we're struggling up here, bud. It's yeah. tough. Hey, no, I hey. Hate you're, 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 <laughs> you know, I didn't come last year to, uh, to Chicago and I, I got the feedback that it was a pretty tough vibe. Um, but it, it's starting to get, there's excitement in the air. The, the yeah, people yeah. who are here are the survivors. That's right. The other ones aren't in business anymore. Thank God. They, last, year, <laughs> last year, people were going out of business and attending. We we're in a good mood. This year, those guys are gone and the survivors are here and they're, they're actually absorbing that market share. They're, they're winning or they figured out the mistakes and now they're, they're thriving in the yeah, challenging yeah, yeah. market. So there is a pretty positive vibe going on right now and I, i'm optimistic for the next few years i really am we've, we've noticed that ourselves attending events you know you go back two years three years you can almost see the scale right and it was there was a lot of doom and gloom a lot of negativity you could just feel it you don't need to say anything you don't need to listen to a panel you can feel it and this year especially thus far has been very energetic very positive um and again that's without even having to speak with anyone you walk into a room and you're like this feels good this feels good right 
Um, but regardless, we appreciate you, man. We appreciate all the work you're doing. Much continued success with Cannabis Now and Hemp Magazine. And let's see a brick and mortar again with this CBD wellness. I love it. Let's do it. I'm excited. Awesome. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for joining Legacies. Breadstock e-commerce. It might be time to upgrade. Ah, it's nice getting some insight to the U.S. market, isn't it, Wes? Yeah, very interesting show today. I uh, Different perspectives. Got to get me one of those widget uh, dupe tubes. That's for oh sure. Oh, my God. It, those are wild. Um, the filtration, I was always concerned when I saw some of the filters out there. I'm glad that Michael explained that because I always thought, oh, are they capturing some of the THC molecule in there if they're too good? And then if they're no good, like, you know, I'm glad that he was able to explain that. Um, because I've seen, I've seen their wares before we even became aware of their technologies. So pretty wild. But also interesting with uh, Eugenio on, uh, I mean, everything I've heard so far would be Trump would be better for the cannabis industry. Or what do I know? Um, again, that's why I wanted to ask him straight up. And someone that understands the industry as well. I mean, you know, he's been doing it forever, 12, 14 years, something like that. He's got to have his finger on that pulse. Um, but yeah, I was surprised. I don't know. Maybe we're just getting bias influence from different media sources. Who knows? Potentially. Potentially. It also seems like uh, we might have to do a couple episodes on hemp and help him out there. Holy moly. I've known this for the longest time that industrial hemp will become massive, but you don't really put a lot of thought into it because we're so hyper-focused on cannabis, what's getting you high, what's wellness, you know, and to look at it from... And that's, I'm glad you clarified because I thought the, the Declaration of Independence was, was made of hemp. Um, there was a booming industry once upon a time. And I think that was pre-Reagan. I could be wrong. What do I know about could you US imagine, politics? Could you imagine banning the very piece of paper that your document, that your, your founding document was made on? Like, the, like what? Well, wasn't it, I don't know if it was World War One, World War Two, but the paratroopers, all of their um, para cord was all hemp based. It was the strongest. So from what I understand is, you know, can be stronger than canvas and softer than silk. But again, it's the infrastructure. It's, you know, millions upon millions of dollars investment. Um, and I have seen some really cool shit going on in Europe when it comes to building materials. So I don't know. Interesting episode. We hope that uh, our Canadian audience, maybe this expands us into the US a little bit. Who knows? But we hope our Canadian audience at least understands it a little bit better and it shines some light on it. Um, Man, it's just, there's, I have so many fucking more questions now though. I know, I know. <laughs> like so many more. I think we have some more US guests coming up um, over the next few weeks. So we'll, uh, I'll start writing down all my notes, figure it out. We'll get yeah. there. Perfect. Anyways, thanks for tuning in to Legacies, everyone. We'll see you next week.